we're going through the vetting process and we're looking at who it is that we should support, uh, who's a no-no, uh, who's gonna give us the most opportunities, give our members the most opportunities to get to work. There's three things that we keep in mind, right? It's in this exact order, jobs, wages, and benefits. Before we even ask them to come in and go through the process of where they are on jobs, wages, and benefits is we have to make sure that they truly believe that workers making a good wage, a high wage is important for our country and for our economy. Secondarily, we got to make sure that they believe in unions, that unions are the way to higher wages, uh, you know, a better life. You mentioned an earlier that American dream. And then finally, they have to be obsessed with infrastructure spending. You got to have that politician that wants to build because that's what we do. And then it's having that on a secondary level is somebody that cares enough to say that this should be done at union scale. And it's good for the community when people have health care and they have pension plans and we're training young people. And so when, when you have that, that alignment of somebody that we're building a good tax base with a good strong middle class that's not gonna become dependent on government handouts. And so, you know, I mean, so it's a, it's a interesting balancing act that we have to do when we're trying to get that politician in there to find somebody that'll do that and not just giving us lip service. So let's talk about the most recent thing, right? Can you imagine if Sisolak doesn't take your phone call? Or if, or if a Garcetti and Newsom don't pick up the, the carpenters are we calling, don't worry down. about it. Put them on ice during when the pandemic we, kicked in. Can you imagine? We are no longer essential, right? Talk, talk about your conversation with the governor of Nevada after he forgot in his news conference to mention construction being essential. Yeah, I mean, I think that it was originally slated to be shut down, you know, and I, I first time I ever said it to a governor, but I said, hey, I'm calling bullshit on this. Uh, you, you know, uh, and threw it out there. We're the professionals in the industry. We're the ones that keep jobs safe. Our people are OSHA certified, the trained professionals. Hey, at the end of the day, he says, all right, it's on you then. I want you to chair this task force to making sure we keep it safe. Can you imagine the governor of a state where I believe you have talked about that construction is the number two industry only behind tourism, has enough trust yeah. in a carpenter to just hand over construction during a pandemic to a carpenter? Can you imagine that? You know how, you know how cool that is? You know, the night that that happened, it's about 9.30 at night, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at my, the display case in the lobby of our hall. I got some of my tools are in that display case. And I thought, you know, 36 years ago, I would have never thought as a young apprentice, I would have been negotiating with a governor over a worldwide pandemic. That's right. Um, but you know what though, it, it's, it's not me, it, it's this organization. These relationships don't happen overnight. I've had this uh, a standing committee for, I think it's 24 years now, that has went through, interviewed candidates, come together, compare the scores, you get the endorsement. So for me, uh, I think the biggest misconception of our membership is A, that we don't vet the candidates. And like you said, we have a, a really detailed vetting process and a lot of it's done by our rank and file members. We take an endorsement very serious. It's just not a handout. You've got to earn it. That's right. If we're going to contribute to your campaign, we don't put a stamp on it. You're going to get in the car and you're going to come here and you're going to accept that endorsement in front of our membership because there's a commitment. When you see somebody in the eyes and they look out into the membership and they understand this isn't a handout. I don't want to be a box to check to say I talked to a labor organization, right. I talked to this group, I talked to this group. You know, and, and if that's the case, then we've got to go a different direction if that's who, who made it in the room. But, you know, if we're not there to make sure that maybe that person that went out on the line and said, yeah, we're gonna fund that, that bridge project or maybe it's something controversial, something, and, and then we're not there to show up for them at the next election, 
they're going to wander off and find some new friends. That's how politicians are. It's our job as a union to make sure we monitor it. And if they start finding other friends, then maybe it's time for a divorce. And on the other hand, you know, it, it is a two-way street. We've got to make sure that we're that this relationship propels into that next level constantly, where we've got to be, you know, that that two-year, ten-year, twenty-year plan. We're not talking about a one-year job, a two-year job. We're talking about a twenty-year plan here. That's right. Right. We're talking about getting our members to the next level, so that way they could say, "Hey." Boom, I got me some iced tea. I'm going camping tomorrow because I'm retired now, right? So that's what we're talking about. When we talk about who we endorse and who we don't endorse, we're not talking about two, two months or three years worth of work. We want our members to know that when they're done with this job, they've got somewhere else to go to. It's, it's, it's about careers. It's not about jobs. When, when they come in and sign on the dotted line, we don't want to commit that, hey, you got a job, uh, good luck after that one's done. When they sign on that dotted line, the work we do politically is to ensure that they go from day one to day one of retirement and never have to worry about anything else.